I didn't set out to be a publisher, a president, a CEO, but it is what happened because I was never satisfied with status quo. I didn't really think that the systems, just because they were the way they were, were the way you should see them. A friend of mine says, you know, I think, Michaela, the thing I learned most from you, she said to me just the other day, and she worked for me for a very long time, she said, was that you should see things for what they can be, not for what they are. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy, conversations about the defining moments that shape our lives. On this show, we discuss experience that all humans share between breakthroughs and breakdowns that tend to precede the breakthroughs and how those pivotal milestone experiences tend to pave the way in our lives. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. You know what actually I've come to discover is that I'm more of an auditory Audible, auditory, is that the right word? Yeah, auditory learner. <laughs> I, I like to listen to stuff more than I like to read it. And the listening to it seems to sink into my thick skull better than reading it. So for a limited time, you can try Audible and get two free audiobooks. You just visit my website, BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com, and follow the link on the homepage to take advantage of this sweet deal. This episode is also brought to you by Amazon Fresh. Now, if you're like me and you have a busy schedule, then Amazon Fresh could be the answer. I mean, it's the answer for me. It's super easy. It's super convenient. So skip the checkout line and have fresh groceries delivered to your door. This is a limited time offer. You just got to visit BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com to get the $25 off your first order using Amazon Fresh. Today, my guest is an extraordinary woman. Her name is Michaela O'Connor Abrams. Now, she currently holds the position of CEO of Mocha Plus. It's a Northern California-based business that offers an innovative approach to design thinking and leadership for companies who want to make good design the foundation of their strategy. I'll get a little bit more into that. Now, prior to that, she was CEO and publisher of Dwell Media, Michaela also serves as a consultant for multiple investment firms. She has over 25 years experience in publishing, online branding strategies, trade show management, and strategic business development. Now, over those years, she also held executive positions at companies like IDG, Ziff Davis, McGraw-Hill. Michaela, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jordan. Quite a resume. <laughs> Thank you. And that's, that's only a little like bit of it, I know, but I had to, you know, <laughs> uh, we only have an hour for this interview. Well, I'm glad you didn't keep going or I would have felt even more like Whistler's mother. <laughs> well, you know, I when I wanted to ask you to do this, I, I thought, you know what? We've known each other, I think, over 25 years now. We have 29 to be exact. Wow. You did the math better than I did. <laughs> So we, we've known each other 29 years and you know, I've always been amazed and impressed by the, the, the strength and the power that you just exude as a person. And what is interesting to me, and I want to talk a little bit about, first of all, the breakthrough you shared with me, and just for a little idea of what the listeners are in for, is not only are you this powerhouse businesswoman, but over the last couple of years specifically, you have been confronted with not just business decisions, but personal decisions in the space of your family and loss after loss after loss when it comes to family members. It's one thing if you lose one person, much less a group. And it sounds like that was what you were going to share with me a little bit about today. Yes. And I, I, what I wanted to know before we get into that bit of it, just a kind of a backdrop to who you are in business is, and clarify this for me if, if I'm wrong. So the 25 years you spent with Zip Davis and McGraw Hill was with like technology, big technology books, correct? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now what explain to me in layman's terms, what is Dwell and Mocha Plus to the layperson? Okay. So Dwell was a company formed by actually my neighbor, Lara Dean, because she really wanted to find a way to demystify architecture, champion the profession of architects, and have something that was a, a really beautiful conduit for professionals and consumers through which to have a dialogue. Her own journey, she was not uh, a media professional, nor was she an architect or designer, even by education, but was incredibly interested having purchased a piece of property 
in Mill Valley and endeavoring to build her own home and hired an architect and through that whole process thought, why isn't there, why wasn't there a magazine that could have helped really understand what she was about to embark on and be able to have a a great dialogue and partnership with this architect in a way that would yield her own home, not his or her vision, meaning the architect's. Right. And so after that process, and co- coincidentally, at the end of the process, she meets and marries an architect and was even <laughs> more committed to the mission. And I came along about a year into it when it, it already was a little magazine. And we turned it into a media company on seven platforms, like television, events, digital, product, research, books. And it, it was amazing. I mean, the brand to this day has a, a wonderful halo about modern architecture and design and what, what she really meant and what we meant for all those years, what modern design meant. It really wasn't a style. It was very much about a philosophy about the way we live. And so that, that really gave way to what turned into 16 years there as her CEO mm-hmm. to understand the role that design plays in every industry in all walks of life, not just in architecture or just in interior design or furniture design or graphic design, but whole intentional ways of designing for the consumer, designing for a customer, which is really what design thinking, which is now bantied about quite a bit. That's really what it's all about, Hmm. is just putting the customer at the center of your model. And that is now what I'm doing with the companies who are my clients with Mocha Plus. And Mocha, by the way, just being Michaela O'Connor Abrams, not the Museum of Contemporary Art. <laughs> got, got it. Okay. Very, thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Uh, especially if you're going online and searching for it. Do not leave out the plus. Right. So you're still coming from a, a publishing book platform, right? I mean, I'm just, what I'm asking, I guess what I'm looking for here is the distinction or the difference or the seeming shift from technology like IDG, McGraw Hill, you know, to design. Is there a big difference or does it just seem semantically like a difference? No, well, certainly there's a big difference in the market and the industry and who the clients are, et cetera. But the beauty of really focusing on brand. And I I think that I was always doing that, not necessarily in consciously, but I was never terribly interested in or excited by the kind of traditional publishing processes, right? The write something, sell an ad against it, do circulation. I mean, it was fascinating. And obviously, it's an age old industry around the world. But being in it, And coming up through the sales and marketing side, even though my degree was in journalism, and the reason that happened is I found how much writers made. I thought, wait a minute, I'll use my writing skills on the side that makes money, actually. (laughs) I still have great reverence for the art of journalism. Anyway, the, the whole point was I realized early on, but I think it was just because I was intensely interested in how you grew a brand, whether it was in print or online or on television, and there were different vehicles, but how did you fundamentally serve this community of people. You know, you could find a market not yet tapped or or an information source not yet developed. But how did you, you know, how does one do that? Well, so even in technology, when I was CEO of Business 2.0, and it was a magazine at that point, the way in which we developed the voice and the whole core mission of what was Business 2.0 It was completely extensible across all platforms. We developed a conference. We developed a book series. We had webinars. We, you know, you name it, Mm -hmm. right? Well, the same then I realized was going to be true with any brand that was able to really gather a community of passionate people around the subject matter. And so I really built those skills in technology publishing and media and brought them to dwell and found that they really very well translated. So it was more uh, the practice of how do you develop a core brand? And gotcha. for a long time, people said, you know, can't you just be satisfied publishing a magazine called Dwell? I mean, it's gorgeous. And the paper is perfect. And the subject matter is great. And you actually show real life happening, not just pretty pictures. And right. And I said, no, because 
when you're satisfying a community of people, why would you send them someplace else to get their information in an event or online or through a book or with product? Why not serve them on all of the platforms on which they seek information on the subject matter? So that's really how we built it. Got it. All right. And you know, you said the word age old business industry and and it's always kind of like, I feel like I'm walking on eggshells sometimes when it comes into this subject, but because the amount of time we've known each other, I've always known you as just being a, a top executive, C-level publisher and a woman. You know what I mean? My mom owned her own company. You were this powerhouse. I had this very interesting model of women around me who were powerful and empowered. Now, the publishing industry, and forgive me if I'm blending the two industries, but at least some of the research I did said that the publishing industry is not male heavy, but female heavy. Is that just in the book publishing or is that across the board? It's, I would say it's really more in book publishing. Okay. Um, now. So it's still a boys are... club. It's still a boys club in the other side. Um, I would say for the most part, I certainly know several very influential and important women who have run large companies, not the least of whom I suppose would be Kathy Black, who was right. the president of Hearst Magazines for a long time, right. um, or uh, Maria Rodale, who runs, you know, Rodale, uh, her family business. And there are others that I can certainly point to. There are a lot sure. of women in the business, but I suppose if you line up the C-suite, you're still looking at the predominant numbers being men. Yes. Now, did did you in in embarking on this industry, did it even cross your mind being a woman in a man's world of this of this business, the kind of competition? I hesitate to say that it's even gotten any better, right? But did that even cross your mind or did you just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to go out there and crush it? Well, it kept crossing my mind only because people kept bringing, bringing it up, it up <laughs> and saying, uh, well, have you hit the glass ceiling? And, you know, do you think you're not getting a promotion you should get, or do you, you know, but otherwise I don't, I will tell you that the oldest old boy network on the planet was McGraw Hill mm -hmm. at the time. And I'm not sure that's changed actually very much, but it was five of the most formidable, incredibly important years in my career growth. And my boss who was near retirement at the time and was uh, had been the head of chemical engineering and was an engineer, a German engineer, no less. He was one of my biggest champions. So I did not personally ever experience the, you know, being patted on the head or someplace else. <laughs> um, <laughs> or marginalized or thought, never. looked down on. It's just, it's, when I asked you the question, I, I'm not surprised by the answer you're giving me. And yet it always feels good to hear that some positive stories because we hear so much obviously the opposite that it you know is, that you do and i will tell you jordan that again it's my personal experience but i the hardest relationships were with female bosses mm -hmm. and thankfully i only had two and you know i i think that the truth of the matter is we are still very new at this this being a team of women supporting each other mm -hmm. and holding each other up. There are all kinds of theories about why that is, that is the scarcity. And there we, therefore we, you know, uh, go immediately into competitive mode against each other. That, I, I don't know. I, I'm not the expert in the subject. I can only say that I feel that we need to do a great deal more to help each other and stand on each other's shoulders. Men have known how to do it for a very long time. Right. But and they also men also compete differently than women do. Right. You know, you just kind of answered my question, but you may have something more to add to it. Just the notion of what kind of message would you give? You have a daughter uh, going into college, right? right? Or is in college. Is in college. Is in college. And what kind of advice would you give to a young woman who's going to be walking into the business world in the next you know, year or so? I, I would say you must be the best person you know how to be always and to look for opportunities as especially as you grow and in age and in wisdom to 
mentor people, men and women alike. And to just always be your best and know that you're never your best because somebody else is less than. You're only your best when you are simply your best. It is right. not relative to anybody else ever. Well, they, I think that's a big point. I think that we as a, as a species are programmed to compare. We're programmed to compare. We can't help but say, he's got this and I don't have that. I want this and she has that. That cunt continuous. And if we're reminding ourselves or if we can work on reminding ourselves that you just keep your side of the street clean and do what you can to be of service to others, things are going to work themselves out. Always. They so, always do. So let's talk then a little bit about your your personal life. And I know we talked a little bit about it converging with your, your business life, but why don't you share with me about the, the, the breakthrough that you have encountered over the last couple of years? Okay. So I, I imagined a life, truly I did, that was growing very old with my parents and my dear friend and my husband, because my parents were very young when they had me. My husband was one of the healthiest people I've ever met. My dear friend was already retired and children raised and very little, if any, stress at all. And so I just romanticized about all this time in retirement that we travel all over the world. And and at any rate, they are now all gone. And I lost them all in a four-year period, the last two, my husband and father, within two weeks of each other just a year and a half ago. So, you know, life pushed the restart button on me. And basically said, well, it's not going to be the way you thought. They say life is what happens when we make another plans. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. You, um, you, and you and got it reminds the, you that you real. are not in control. It, it, it really is. And it's just unfortunate that we have to be sometimes reminded like that. Yeah. You know, that's the thing that yeah. kind of sucks. You know, I, I mean, obviously, you know, obviously I lost my father a few years ago. And there's no way to prepare for those kinds of of losses and we know they're going to happen, but we can't get anywhere near to predicting how we're going to navigate it because it's no. not just, it's just not the loss of the person. It's just, the, it's the impact and the wake that it, that it leaves behind. That's right. And you, you know, and you know, all, all the stages of grief and you're in disbelief and then you're angry and then you're sad. And, and the truth of the matter is that's not a linear process anyway. And you're grieving forever in in some way shape or form the the tidal waves come far less often the more time uh, that goes by but i decided that at the end of last year when i had kind of gone through all the motions of just putting one foot in front of the other and quitting my job um which i thought why well, not my my life is turned upside down and <laughs> i've been there for almost 16 years and it's time to really create the next chapter of my life in every way. Even though, as my daughter said, are you sure you want to, you know, they say not to make any big decisions in the first year. And I said, well, right. I'm sure they say a lot of things, but I need to do this my way. So let me, let um, me back, let me back up just a second. Cause I want to get yeah. the timeline here a little bit. So, so this is 2018. So we roll that back to 2014 is when you started to lose your right. my friend. Mother, and then my friend yep, and then mom. my father and my husband. And your father and husband in the last in the last year, correct? Okay, and then after the loss of the of your father and your husband, when it comes to him and your father passing away, you decide I'm going to stop working for the company I've been working for for 16 years and start my own company. Also, correct. Okay, okay. I just well, wanted, wanted me, to be clear. Let me say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was no. a conscious choice. It was a yeah. you, it's not like you First, were, you know, sent packing. You were you said, I love it. Thanks guys for an amazing journey. I'm gonna go do my own thing now. Exactly. And and the truth of the matter was the founder, who was the owner, right, was more than capable of running her own show. And she still is. Gotcha. So it was a very easy and amicable great. She'd like to run her own company. I really need to just take a deep breath. The truth of the matter is I wasn't really having, having any idea I wanted to start my own company. I really just wanted to rest and to see what bubbled up. I mean, what every time I think about it, which at that point, because it was only a few couple months from the loss, I'd think, 
what am I going to do? That That's what kept coming up. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do to do this? All that Alan and I did together. What am I going to do? How am I going to do all this by myself? How am I going to? And then that turned into, okay, well, you're not in a rush. You're not destitute. Thank God. Have resources. You've been prudent in your investment. So take a deep breath and let's just see what happens. And so I really had an intent of taking six months to a year off. Mm -hmm. And about a month into it, a dear friend said, hey, you know, whenever you're ready, I'd love you to come work with us on some things. And I admire him tremendously and always have. And we've worked together off and on over the years. So I did. And it was just a, you know, two day a week thing on design thinking. And then another client said, oh, I didn't know you were doing this. I just saw you post on that. How would you like to help us? And so I finally thought, well, I guess it's time to really formalize this. And that's when I started the company. And I, the name came literally because I was changing my LinkedIn profile. And instead of writing consultant, I just thought, okay, well, for the moment, I'm just going to call it Mocha Plus because those are my initials and people in business who get to know me very well saying, oh, hey, Mocha. Um, so I thought, well, I'll do that. And the yeah. plus sign being whomever wants to join me on an appropriate project based on their skill set. Mm-hmm. So that was not some long branding exercise that was saying, good, <laughs> this is a nice name for LinkedIn because I don't want to write consultant. You know, so, sometimes the little the happy accidents come that way. They do. And it, and it's, it's been great. Other yeah. than, as I say, the reason I differentiated a few minutes ago and said, not the Museum of Contemporary Art, because I can't tell you the number of people who wrote to me and said, wow, I'm really looking into being a curator. Could you help me? Tell me more about what it means to manage the museum. And I thought, oh, dear, pretty soon the Museum of Contemporary Art is going to call me and ask (laughs) uh, where I am on the payroll. (laughs) Where you are. Exactly. So in regard to managing the loss of close loved ones and also starting a new business, there's this very possible experience of, of experience overwhelm, you know, that sense of being unfocused or lacking focus. Is there anything, any strategies that you impart or have imparted that help you to navigate those times? Yes. Um, and one of them is really being careful not to make um, big decisions, just like you always hear. Don't don't sign any big contracts. Don't sell your home. Don't go buy a new home. Don't, you know, don't do anything major because you really aren't thinking totally clearly. And it, it's true. You're, you're not. Um, and so, but, but it's also not being frantic about it either. It's really taking the time to take a deep breath or when I would find I was starting to get anxious about things and feel like, wow, this is, I'm, I'm just, am I doing the right thing? Am I, I would kind of start that cycle. I would truly I would go out, take the dogs and I'd go for about an hour long walk, mm-hmm. just kind of get the endorphins going, clear the mind. Yeah. And 99.9% of the time, your mind calms down. You realize that you don't have to make any of those decisions immediately. Right. And that if you, if there was a decision you had to make, it was not irreparable that you could make the decision if you felt you had to, but it wasn't one that you could not change, augment, et cetera. So it's really just trying to stay in the moment. And also, frankly, remembering my husband's famous, perhaps one of his most important pieces of advice that he started when we were dating because he could see me um, ruminating over lots of different things each day. And he'd say, Michaela, 84, 84% for of the things you worry about never happen. Yeah. And I'd say, but I am worried about the 16% that does. And he'd say, yeah, and that's crazy <laughs> because if 84% of the time they don't happen, you have wasted all that time worrying about something. And the truth of the matter is if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. So worry about it when it happens. That's right. And I got, I think I got pretty good at that. It probably took me 10 years, but I got much better at it. And let me just tell you, nothing was more important than those words when I was faced with really that, that ending in such a profound way with his, with losing him and my parents and my friend. 
yeah. um, was just, you know, it was going to happen anyway. So I, I was able to take the one day at a time and to really cherish each moment that we had together and building on those and keeping a sense of humor. And God knows, as you remember, Jordan, yeah. he had an amazing Primo. drive. Primo. Wit. And it was it was intact up until the day he passed. So yeah. <clears throat> um, that was really the most important. And what I would say to anybody is you, you will be frantic at times. You will be because that's what grief does. That's what loss does and, and loss at, at any level. But you just have got to pull yourself back and do something that moment for yourself. Preferably if you have an issue, don't take a drink of something, but unless it's water, but go for a walk, go for a hike. Call a friend and go paddleboarding. Go whatever. Get yeah. out. Get no, out I, I completely hear you. You know, I've, I've talked to a number of people, and obviously, you can read books, go to seminars. You know, and most of the guys and gals who are these forward-thinking personal professional training development coaches, if you will, you know what what I hear you saying is you change your state. You that's right. You consciously assert yourself or insert yourself into the situation and go whoa 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 and. But you have to, like you said, get present. It's you almost have to get back into being present because you're not present. When you're frantic, you're not present. You're in the That's past right. or you're in the future, worried That's about right. what might happen or dwelling on what's happened in the past and hoping it doesn't happen again. Yeah. So being able to, like you, you know, said, find out whatever that is for you. If it's going for a run, going to yoga, meditating, journaling, whatever, just do it. And that's, exactly. but you have to practice it. And the, that's the piece of it too. I think you have to practice it and know that it's a part of your toolbox. And, you know, another a piece that you said about, I love what you said that Alan said, and I've said that many times with my wife, which is don't worry about it until you need to worry about it. Right. And I, you know, a few years ago, random, I mean, honestly, I'd never been really into a hospital except for being born and getting my children out of the hospital. That was my experience being in a hospital up until about five years ago. And I ended up getting bronchitis one year and it laid me out. I was, had never been sicker in my life and I didn't know it, but it turned into pneumonia and then kind of got better. And before I knew it, I was on my knees one afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon by myself in pain, thinking I'm having a heart attack. I was like this pain in my chest. Like I, I never knew could feel I couldn't breathe. It felt like there was a, a stabbing in my heart. I was like, oh my God, uh, am I having a heart attack? And I'm alone. Tears streaming down my face. My wife walks in with my kids, sees me on my knees and she goes, oh my God, should I call the ambulance? And I, I said, no, just put me in the car. I'll be to the emergency room faster that way. She drives me to the emergency room. I'll tell you right now, and you, maybe you know this, you want to get an e-ticket to the front of the line at the emergency room. Tell them you're having heart can, you know, heart problems. <laughs> tell them your heart's, yeah. tell them you're having heart pain in your chest. You'll get to the front of the line. Got to the front of the line. They checked me in. I, they do an EKG rule out that I had a heart attack. So now what? I'm acute pain. Then they say, we're going to take some pictures, MRI, that kind of thing. You know, take a closer look at what's really going on in your, in your chest. Cause it felt like my, felt like it was in that area of my heart, lungs area. So they take a picture and everything takes forever, right? In the hospital, specifically oh, yeah. the emergency room. And of course, my phone dies, no power, no cell service. <laughs> and so I'm sitting in this empty, poorly lit emergency room. My wife has to, has, has to actually leave to deal with my children. And we haven't figured out what the pictures are. The picture comes and the doctor sits down and gives us that. So, Mr. Mrs. Murphy, we've reviewed the film you know they're trying to very carefully choose their words mm -hmm. while all they're doing is making me think what aren't they saying <laughs> and right. so and she says we found something in the film on your lungs it looks like there's a shadow you know they're trying to figure out the words to use without saying cancer or tumor <laughs> and and i and she never said cancer or tumor but they couldn't determine what it was. So we wanted, we want to check you in, do a bronchoscopy, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, or short story long, I guess, is she leaves the room and I'm left there with my wife and my wife is ready, is starting to cry. And 
I thought the first thing that came to my mind, it what Adam said, or I'm sorry, what Alan said, don't worry about it until there's something to worry about. Right. They didn't say you have cancer. We need to cut it out. They didn't say you're dying in five weeks. They didn't say anything. But the human being that we are, unfortunately, we tend to jump to the worst case scenario. Absolutely. And it's just, it's not necessary. And like you said, 84%, 16%, you know, we don't need to worry about what we don't need to worry about. But it's, right. it's, it's part of our human condition, unfortunately. If you look at the reptilian brain, that fight or flight, mm-hmm. it's, it's conditioned in us from, from when we were cave people running from saber toothed tigers. You know, that, exactly. that, that stress level that is in, in, engaged in us to run at high speeds when being chased by a saber toothed tiger. Well, right. we don't have to worry about saber toothed tigers anymore. And yet most of us are running at 500 RPMs or higher. Exactly. So yes, um, I, 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 I really get and uh, couldn't agree more with the, you know, don't worry about it until it's necessary to worry about it. That's right. That's right. I mean, you know, had I been wringing my hands about every day's changes and my dad and Alan, you know, at the end, I would have lost all of that time that I had with them before they left, of course, right? Um, to just be there and be present. And that was invaluable. That, that is, was really is, invaluable. I, that's one of the most powerful things, I think, that I, I mean, that's amazing for you to have had the wherewithal to step in and say, stop that, be here. This is important. Right. And, and it, and it, it took, you know, it's, it does take a discipline, right? I mean, you, there were times when I really had to yank myself back sure. into just, you know, Michaela, this is the way it's probably going to play out here. So now, now, now recalibrate your approach to all of this. So you and obviously, I'm, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry, recalibrate your approach. Sorry. Yeah. No, to all of this and, and just, stay in the moment as often as you can. And, you know, again, um, yeah, and my dad did this too in, in his own way. It would just it'd be the reminder. They kept saying, you know, uh, you're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. They kept saying, you are going to be okay. I'm sorry that I'm not going to be here to mm-hmm. take care of you, but you're going to be okay. Yeah. yeah. So that was also extremely important. It was like, even though I didn't want to hear that right. at that time, I also, you know, in the back of my brain was saying, okay, they're right. They're right. And if they were, st- and this is what I do today in, in my discipline, if I have a, a low point or just certain songs or smells or whatever just really yanks me back to that place, I imagine them all standing in mm. front of me saying, hey, grab the reins because we'd love to be here, but we can't. Mm-hmm. And so you have got to live life to its fullest, mm-hmm. like with gusto, because that's really what will honor us yeah. not being sad. Yeah. So it's obviously been a intense, powerful, transitional, transformational uh, last few years. And you've shared some of, you know, the behaviors and habits and things like that. But in the last five years, what new belief or behavior or habit have you, um, you know, has most improved your life? Something that maybe you didn't do before, but you've embraced over the last five years. I would say, and this is still a process, so I have not mastered it, but one of my big weaknesses is saying no. I, <laughs> I want to say yes to everything that's ever asked of me and do whatever people need and however many people all at once. And <laughs> And, um, you know, at one point you just can't because you have priorities that, you know, need to more than, than the average husband, father, mother, et cetera, need to. And so it was learning to say no without guilt, without regret, without all angst that comes with feeling like that no comes with serious disappointment and you're letting people down and, you know, who else is going to do it? Well, again, I careful to say this is still in process, but boy, I have come a long, long way by necessity, right? But that necessity now is not as 
present as it was during the time of their failing health and, and impending death. But I haven't lost the discipline that I, that I gained through that. And I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it because I, I still do find myself going, Oh, sure. I, Oh boy, wish I hadn't have done that. But, but it really is freeing there. It is really freeing to be able to say, no, I can't, or I can do this, not that, whatever that is. And if that would be helpful, happy to do that. If that's not what you need right now, that's okay too, but I'm unable to help you do whatever that is. And boy, there, it is so freeing is the only word that comes to mind, but it is really freeing and it allows you to be present. And that's why it's so important because if you're saying yes to a lot of things, you're really not honoring yourself or anybody else around you. Right. That, I mean, that's what I hear most of all is really learning to take care of yourself. Yes. It first. is. It is. Absolutely. Uh, so tell me something um, you think others who know you would be surprised to learn about you. <laughs> I mean, yes. Well, hmm. <laughs> Uh, what is your show rated? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, um, no, hey, but sky's yeah. the limit. Sky's yeah. the limit. <laughs> Let's turn um, a corner. Let's turn a corner. <laughs> they would be surprised to know that I did not want to be president of the United States. I wanted to be first lady. Interesting. Because <laughs> everybody and, thinks and that you should be that, president. I wrote that in my high school yearbook. So that, people people tend to think that because you're a CEO, president, publisher, that you want to be the president. Right. Okay. And I think I probably, um, when I look back at even my youth, whether it was selling Girl Scout cookies or being chairman of the prom or class president, or you know, I always tended to want to say, "Oh, it's okay, I'll run it, I'll do it." And so I think, you know, when I wrote that I really want to be first lady, I'm like, <laughs> "What? What? Either that means you really think that the first lady really runs the country, or that." <laughs> You just really like supporting people rather than just doing it, you know, yourself. And, um, is it the latter? A bit of truth in both of those okay. things, but it's really, it's really the latter. Yeah. I get great satisfaction out of propelling teams or just guiding teams and watching their growth. I, I would always say in my company meetings that my report card about how well I did as the CEO was not the budget. It was what culture was I fostering? How did people feel about working at the company I was running? Would they want to stay? Did they recommend people come join them? Yeah. Did they want to return if they left? Um, what What would they say about their time? Yeah. What was I like to work for and how did I make them feel? That was more important to me than anything. Well, you know, so they, they say the leader, the leader, it's not about the position, but about the ability to inspire others. Right. Exactly. And, exactly. But and I think that's a, I think it's a really wise position to take for longevity as well. You know, I think you can burn out if you're just purely ego driven and you just want the position and the accolades for yourself. But when you can inspire others to have victories, it, it comes back to us tenfold. I agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, for an employee of years ago to reconnect with me, whether it's on Facebook or I bump into them at an event, whatever, and say, oh, Kayla, I still remember that sales meeting at, you know, in at Spanish Bay or in Cancun or wherever. And it was the best one I've ever been to. I never, ever attended one better than that mm. because we just learned so much and, and it just, the appreciation that was shown for our work done and and that just, you know, that just makes me feel fabulous that I was able to create such memorable experiences and make them feel better about what they were doing. That to me was worth everything. Yeah. So speaking of, you know, things that people would be surprised to learn about you um, and, you know, we could still go into the, you know, R rated version here, but <laughs> is, is what, what is an, an unusual habit? or an absurd thing that you love? Hmm. 
unusual habit or absurd thing. Wow. <laughs> That's a, that's a good that's good to stump somebody um I, I, you really have because i'm trying to th- unusual habit right i don't because i guess the question is like do, do, is it if it's your habit do you consider it unusual <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly probably right. not i consider it just you know a habit that i makes total um, sense to you yeah I, uh, we, well we get, and this is okay. this is not new what i didn't you know alan would be lying next to me for what now is by myself i love watching the Thin Man series with Myrna Loy and William Powell and eating buttered popcorn. That just It's your happy place. In bed. Right. <laughs> uh, all afternoon. Uh, or all evening. Or, or all evening. Or, start, or even starting at 10 at night and thinking, well, I'll just do a few. And then all of a sudden it's two in the morning because I just can't stay. I just have to keep watching them. Thankfully, I, I don't keep popping gallons of popcorn, but right. I do enjoy that. <laughs> Right, gotcha. So, are you a are you a reader of books? I am. I would like to be a much better reader of fiction. That I I have four books stacked up here right now that people have given me since Christmas and my birthday, and I find that when I take the time to read, I'm reading some new business book or mm-hmm. some new self help book or mm-hmm. some book that maybe a friend has written about. Well, in the case of Chip Conley, Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs called Peak. And just I'm fascinated by what motivates people, what makes them the professionals or the people in business that they are. But I really am craving just to go to my fiction stack and do that because I used to do that a lot. Do you refer books to people when all, you've read them? All the time. What's the last one you say you would say, oh, my God, I've got to share this with X, Y, Z? I would say most recently, and it's not a new book, it's called Blah, Blah, Blah. And (laughs) it is literally B-L-A-H, B-L-A-H, B-L-A-H. And I cannot even believe that my synapse is not working enough to tell you the author's name, who I know um, well and is a delightful man, Dan Rome, R-O-A-M. And it's really about something that's so obvious, but that he really developed. And that's that we were back speaking of the cavemen and, and our instincts, we communicated with drawings, right? Yep. With the cave drawings, with Sanskrit, with all those things. And so we didn't become such a verbal society until the, the last perhaps, um, you know, thousand plus years. And therefore we, we lose the ability to communicate really well through pictures and drawings. So he really takes you through what it means to go back to using fewer words and more pictures and Mm -hmm. how much more effective that is at communicating concepts, ideas, whether that's for selling something or presenting something to convince people, to persuade them that pictures. And so it basically says, you know, cut your words way, way, way down. And go back to drawing the pictures and look at how much more effective it will be. Um, So it's a fun, fun book. Um, It's funny. You make me think of I was just watching a special about Einstein and he or the documentary was sharing about how he would do thought exercises or thought experiments. And a lot of the breakthroughs he had to his theories came from his imaginings from his visualizations of something that you can't put into words. You can't put into a algorithm or into a, a, a problem that, you know, you would see on a big, huge board, you know, but he would actually, when it came to gravity, for example, he had this image in his mind of a person in a box and was it being pulled down or was it being pushed down? And was it gravity? I mean, it was his way of brilliantly, being able to come to answers or come to theories that most people obviously never had up to that point. And it was based on his ability to visualize it, to see it, not to express it in words, but to see it visually in yeah, pictures. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's, if you think about it, I mean, we used to be, you know, those mind numbing overhead presentations and then went to PowerPoint and, you know, putting as many words as you could on the slide and just 
absolutely boring people to tears rather than beautiful images and you just spoke to them as you present. I mean, the difference in how receptive the audience is and the storytelling that goes along with just putting your words to pictures that people are seeing is night and day. Yeah. Well, you're triggering an emotional response as opposed to, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm now I'm now I can't speak. Um, you know, you're, you're triggering an emotional experience rather than just your brain experience. So, and, and we want to feel and that feeling when it's matched with words and matched with ideas, it sinks in even right. deeper. Yep. So yeah, makes sense. Well, tell me something about yourself that you used to view as a weakness or something that was shameful to you and that you now take pride in. Okay. I used to really feel that the fact that I didn't go on and get my MBA was always going to be a detriment to my future. That my career wouldn't ever be as big as it could have been if I had just done that at any point in that first 10 years out of college. Well, perhaps even 20 years after college, but then it kind of becomes like, you know, really? I'm pretty sure the experiences has um, outweighed what you would learn out of the books. Right. And I'll tell you that it probably was, not probably, it most definitely was right before taking on the Dwell uh, role as CEO and building that company that I started to meet many more people who, some of whom actually hadn't even finished college. And I wouldn't recommend that necessarily because I still think the degree is important because it's a goal and a milestone that you, you know, you reached, you fulfilled mm -hmm. it. Right. I, not, my, my feeling about school also, and I didn't really get this until I was done is, uh, I don't know. I feel like school was a space where I learned how to learn. That's right. That's so exactly you can't you right. can't you can't sacrifice that because you feel like you're not going to use the degree, but the experience of those two years or four years, whatever you do to get your degree, it's the it's that experience that you can't forego, or you 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 might be missing something if you do forego it. Right, right. That's exactly right, and and so that's well, and that's why I held this whole MBA thing. In, in such high regard and of such great import, yet I absolutely had zero energy to do that. Every time I'd think about it and applying for it, I just felt completely drained and enervated. And I thought, well, okay, you know, <laughs> usually you're not going to be very successful if you're going into something dreading it. Um, so I just never did. And I, I, I don't know. I've, so my career spans, about 30 plus years. And I would say it took at least half of that to really lose that whole thing mm -hmm. and realize that the experience that I was then living was my MBA. Right. It was hands down the best experience um, that, you know, that I would not have gotten in a program. Now, would I have still learned something valuable and had an important experience? Absolutely. Because sure. I don't believe if you actually do something that um, that you come away empty ever, unless you're just not listening and paying attention. Right. It, it, so there's no doubt it, I would have uh, come away with important um, ideas and lessons, etc. But I, I really let go of it as a limitation because what I realized was I was truly – unwittingly allowing that to hold me back. So when, yeah. when people, especially like my husband would say years ago, I mean, early on into uh, our relationship and which was only about six, seven years into my career, he'd say, why aren't you going for the senior vice president job? Or why aren't you going for that? I'd say, well, what? I can't, you know, that's for, and then I'd name so-and-so. Interesting. Typically, so and so who had an MBA or who mm -hmm. did Ivy League the whole way or whatever. Yeah. And he'd say, that's ridiculous. And he had an MBA from Wharton. And so 
<laughs> he certainly was coming from a place of experience. Yeah. It's that's ridiculous, Michaela. That's just ridiculous. And it was really, I, I give Alan the credit for saying, I want you to just reach for that because you deserve it. You've got all the acumen you need yeah. for that. And so truly, I didn't set out to be a publisher, a president, a CEO, but it is what happened because I was never satisfied with status quo. I didn't really think that the systems, just because they were the way they were, were the way you should see them. A friend of mine says, you know, I think, Michaela, the thing I learned most from you, she said to me just the other day, and she worked for me for a very long time, she said, was that you should see things for what they can be, not for what they are. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's probably exactly because I just, I was bored with, you know, things just doing them because they were the way they were. I'd think, well, what can I do differently or better yeah. to make it bigger, to make it more interesting, to make it more fun, to make whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I hear is it's like you were, you told yourself a story for many years that people who have MBAs get these positions and people with MBAs don't. And right. you believed that story, even though it was complete bullshit. Right. For 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 many years, to your chagrin, I mean, to your you were like you said, you were holding yourself back, and it's so great that you had your partner, but you had the wherewithal to hear your husband also and give it up, let it go, because so much of those stories are complete bullshit made up from something that we were like a kid, right? And and we think it's the truth, and when you yep. suddenly get, it's not the truth. It's incredibly freeing. And that is, I think, a doorway right there for a breakthrough. Yeah, it but, is. But you got to you got to disappear that old conversation first. And unfortunately, right. most of the time we don't even see it's there. Exactly. Because we believe we, it's we, the truth. Yeah. Well, because we're so good at telling ourselves the story yeah. about what we are. I mean, I it's kind of a tangent, but last night, Taylor and your mom and I watched I feel so pretty with Amy Schumer. Mm. Not, you know, not some epic movie that I'm recommending everybody rush out to see or get on, <laughs> on iTunes. But, but it was, it, I mean, I thought about it because it was exactly that, right? She hits her head and so she sees somebody else. It's still herself. Everybody else sees the same person. Yeah. She sees this beautiful woman. Yeah. And so she starts behaving completely differently. Yes. I mean, kind of, it's a little outlandish and of course overplayed, et cetera. Right. And then she hits her head again and goes, oh my God. I'm not beautiful anymore. And because what are you talking about? You've not changed a bit, except that your whole attitude just changed again. Yeah. And it just proved that it's if you think differently mm -hmm. about yourself mm -hmm. and stop telling yourself a story about your limitation or why you can't do this or you're invisible or you're what, if you stop that, then you, other people will see you differently. Yeah. And it might take a little bit of time. I mean, it's like basically you, you know, go around, everybody, you know, looks at you and they see a square and suddenly you're saying you're a triangle. It might take a little bit of time for them to get that transformation. But right. I think with a commitment and with discipline and with action, ultimately you're going to get the agreement that you already created from the past <laughs> again, newly for something, hopefully that's empowering to you. So, exactly. I mean, my feeling is, and I, I've said this on many of the interviews is, is that we keep on telling ourselves these stories over and over again and thinking that they're going to uh, think, b believing them. And if, and if we don't stop believing them, we kind of have a, a predetermined, you can almost say what's going to happen to the person. That, you know, based on the fact that if they say I'm no good at this or they say I can't be a, a CEO because of this, then you're right. You can't. You, right. You, I mean, that's a whole self-fulfilling prophecy thing, yes. right? Yeah. If you walk around saying, you know, I'm too heavy or I'm too thin or I'm too short or I'm too tall or I'm too whatever yeah, it anything. is, well, then you'll get to own it for sure. And here's the thing, too, is that most oftentimes what we're saying is we actually don't even think that it's. We believe it and we're doing it accidentally more oftentimes right. than not. Most human beings are doing, and I say that I include myself, right? But we do these things unconsciously and we don't even realize it. And we're so good at it. We actually manifest things we don't want and wonder why it's happening. 
That's right. But it's happening because we're doing it. So exactly. if we're so good at it and skilled at doing things that we don't want to manifest, what happens if we actually stepped in and started to provide information and, and, and new stories that empowered us? What right. might happen then? What and to that end, another a book that is I don't even is it twenty years old now? It's Scott Adams, The Dilbert Future. Mm -hmm. So it's hysterically funny if you like Dilbert and the absurdities that he gets every day. Right. But there's an amazingly poignant end to that because he talks about his practice of deciding very intentionally that he was going to be the most successful business satirist comic writer and he wrote 15 times a day yeah. i am the most successful kind of the whole neuro-linguistic program that's right thing. yes and and it manifests itself and he in fact was yep so now you know there are of course things you i wouldn't write 15 times a day i'm going to be a brain surgeon or i am the best brain surgeon you know it has to be within some realm of possibility but it does I, it makes a big difference yep how you talk about yourself. Yeah, completely. Because how you talk about yourself and how you believe yourself, other people are going to get it, even if you're not saying it out loud. That's right. They, they can smell it. I mean, you can, it's an, it's an energy, whatever you want to say it is, but it's there. And it I mean, I know when, I mean, there were times in my career, you know, as an actor, when I was not feeling particularly confident and it was no doubt that I wasn't booking. It was no, you know, surprise that I wasn't booking because I was going in the room desperate, you yeah. know, like, please hire me. And once that shifted, my booking work shifted, my career shifted, but I had to do that. Absolutely. I had to, I had to step in. Well, I mean, you know, this is, this is like the beginning of a whole new episode when it comes to NLP and uh, neurological synapses and <laughs> whole other, yes. whole other conversation that I'm, I'm hu a huge fan of. But I want to say thank you for giving me the amount of time you have today, considering your, your, your busy schedule. I mean, it was tricky enough getting us on the phone together. So I'm super happy that we got this hour to, uh, to chat. It was great, Jordan. It was really great. And I love the other podcasts that I've been listening to and the other stories. It's it's fascinating. I really look forward to hearing more. Cool. Thank you, Michaela. And uh, everybody else, thanks for listening to the podcast. And I'll see you next time on Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible.com and Amazon Fresh. Check out those promotional giveaways on the front page of my website. Stay tuned for more episodes of Breakthroughs with Jordan Murphy. Check out my website at BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com. Stay connected on Instagram at BreakthroughsWithJordan and Twitter at Jordan D. Murphy. And if you have a great story to share, as I'm sure many of you do, go to my website at BreakthroughsWithJordanMurphy.com and shoot me an abbreviated version of your story to my email. I'll give it a read and maybe share a couple of them on the show. 